stop the broadcast and there we go ha let's put up the magic light bulb hello show clickety clack and all kinds of devices are there gears inside of our head who knows and um here's the wonderful little logo that uh, peter came up with which we do not yet have soundtrack on and here is my uh, troubles in paradise um ruling james downard rj tortukenwordpress.com and uh, if you don't have this on your uh, website uh, links, uh, why not? Because that's where I've got my stuff and put up links to various things and so forth and so on. So hi to the show. Stop sharing on that. Close down files because I got a limited amount of material to work with on my damn memory. Um, uh, howdy. Uh, we're going to have a neat discussion on Kent Hovind through most of the show. Um, ostensibly, I'm continuing to do... Uh, the analysis of contested bones, uh, which is continuing to show, hi, old scratch is in the is in the live chat. Um, that um, it's a creator that is, is attempting to dispute human evolution. It's a lot of the same old, same old. It doesn't have an index. It doesn't have a bibliography. I'm constructing one, and a common pattern is emerging. About forty some percent of the material is drawn on for authority quotes. Um, and of roughly 40 some odd percent of the technical literature they cite, they're misrepresenting in that they are suppressing or ignoring information that doesn't fit their model, which is apes on one side, human beings on another, and then the shuffleboard to figure out what kind of fits on either one of these non-overlapping notions. Homo habilis is uh, the little still murky area because there's relatively few fossils involved in the transitions between those busy little Australopithecines that we know have a ton of species and pre-Australopithecines. And then things when things start winnowing out and you start having much more stabilized Homo erectus, although there's regional variations and we know that there's the Denisovans and then the Neanderthal offshoots and our offshoot, that all of which keeps on pushing farther and farther back into time, back into 300, 300,000 years, 500, 600,000 in the case of, of Neanderthals. And Homo habilis is in that no man's land or not yet man land between the Australopithecines and Erectus. And there is still a legitimate debate going on as to whether or not Homo habilis is a single taxon with a lot of variety to it, not impossible, or a bunch of different species that are in that transition node because they're showing stuff that's carrying over Australopithecine features and then also um, seemingly more human Homo features, which is why there's still the debate about whether or not it's in the Homo uh, category. Overall, the fact that it's still classified Homo habilis and not an Australopithecine habilis, and the issue of whether or not um, other Australopithecines or mainly the other Australopithecines were still doing tools at this time, and just exactly what little thread connects up Homo erectus, it's still an open debate because we don't have a lot of data. All the fossils are highly fragmentary. You don't have a complete Homo erectus thing. You've got bits and pieces of stuff associated that tell you clues, and that's the stuff that's in the papers I put the links up to. Remember, the principle that I use is always to put full text, not abstracts, and so everybody gets to follow along. They get to read the whole material. They can download it and read it at their leisure so they don't have to take my word for it. And you'll see there's lots of stuff in there. They're all talking about the ongoing path of getting more relevant data and trying to develop every scrap of information to figure out what's going on. And that stuff just doesn't get discussed. So there's my quick whoop summary of uh, the uh, the recent Homo habilis stuff. And we want to spend the main show with Jackson Wheat, who has decided dun, 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 to debate Kent Hovind. And I have done that, and I want him to have as much fun with it as I did and to have as much success as I did. So he can tell a little bit about what his end of it is, and then we're going to dive into some Kent Hovind video crap. Well, hello, everyone. I was uh, asked by Modern Day Hysteria, who also hosted the debate between RJ and Kent Hovind, uh, if I wanted to debate Hovind, and after some hemming and hawing, I finally said okay I'll do it so uh, asked for the debate is did the flood of Noah happen and so RJ and I have been gathering sources and data regarding that because very clearly it did not happen <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah uh, it was kind of unsure whether you want, you were getting it or not but apparently now it's finalized I think for November 8th right yeah. yes at 9pm nine, nine uh, central and because 
The little grasshopper Jackson is a follower of source methods. I want him to follow the source methods approach, which is um, uh, to not merely debate a generic flood model and to be able to show why it's twaddle, but specifically to point out why Kent Hovind's version of the flood model is super twaddle. So I uh, a bit the bullet and uh, watched two Kent Hovind videos uh, over the last few days, uh, an hour, hour and 40 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes long. And uh, um, I, I, I was trying to find two nodes in the discussion. One was um, the odds are that most of the videos you're seeing of Kent Hovind are older. And in fact, that's the case. The, there are several postings of the 2005 video that I put up and people will repost the same video slightly edited, which uh, I discovered. Uh, but I discovered uh, you, you can figure it out because Kent Hovind is standing in front of the same podium with the same red tie on and the same suit and is starting to say the same lines. I think it's the same video. OK. Uh, anyway, apparently it dates from about 2005 at, uh, at the time that he was about ready to go into the slammer. Uh, and uh, it it presents a whole suite of positions that he's doing, many of which are extremely old, even the time he's putting them forward. Then, fortunately, the little tweep, uh, in December of 2017, did a little flood thing. That's recent Hovind in the flowery shirts down there from uh, uh, Alabama. And now you can see what he repeats from his older material and what he doesn't put new, <laughs> like nothing, so I went through and analyzed a bunch of them uh, and put a variety of links, again, full text uh, in the notes. And Jackson, I hope, will be also looking at that stuff and can do follow up on his own thing and fold that into his uh, preparations. And we still got like a week or so for him to do that. So time, time, time. Uh, you can do a lot of research in a week and a lot of coordinating in a week. Uh, so um, the most of the stuff was in the 2005 video. I'll be looking down period periodically. And since it is Halloween, although it's still early here uh, and still not quite dusk, I'm hoping that there will be no bing bong from the little Halloween kids showing up at the door. If so, and I suddenly rip off my thing and race out of the room, you know why. Uh, and so towards the later end of the show, that might happen. Typically, there are not a lot of kids in the neighborhood and they tend to wait until after dusk and they go in little grouping. So I'm hoping, hoping that six, seven, eight o'clock will be the range that I'll have to worry about the ding-dongs and we'll be safe. But if not, you know what's happened. I've not been raptured. Anyway, um, uh, one thing to remember about Hovind is that he relies a heck of a lot on um, uh, Walt Brown. Uh, if you don't know about Walter Brown, he's a, a, another bottom feeder. He's been around for years. He presents a lot of very geeky technical citation stuff. Uh, uh, that he has assembled. So he's technically a fact claimant, but boy, is he sloppy. Kent Hovind is not a fact claimant. He's a copyist. And uh, uh, fortunately, most of Walt Brown's crap is online. And a lot of it has been criticized a lot previously. And uh, so two of the ones that pop up um, uh, that he likes to mention is one, the idea that uh, Hovind mentioning from Walt Brown, that there were uh, five million mammoths that all died in one giant catastrophe. And he links to the chart that shows uh, in Walt Brown's work where he documented this stuff. Oh gosh, that's a mistake. Uh, because um, all Brown has done is plot a bunch of different sites from a bunch of different technical literature. No evidence whatsoever that those belong to the same time frame, that they all flash froze all at the same time in one single catastrophe. Brown doesn't even establish that, let alone anybody else. And Brown has gotten a lot of criticism over the years uh, from people who point out how he cherry picks and doesn't read the original primary sources. I, I had already begun a little bit of background researching on that stuff, and it's buried in my stacks of notes somewhere or other. Uh, but I put some linkages to some of the critics that are up so you can get caught up more to speed on that one, plus the thing to Walt Brown's little chart. And then one of his experiments, you should put it in quotes, experiments that, that Brown did, uh, liquefaction. He wanted to prove that you put uh, a reptile and a bird and a mammal in a slurry of gunk, and they will settle out at different levels that fit the fossil record and the flood deposits. Well, the critics of this have been asking which birds, which mammals, which, uh, uh, how long did they, had they been recently dead? Were they still alive? Do you realize that animals bloat? that they float to the surface. There's a whole bunch 
of, of, of variables that would have to be taken into account here, which Brown has been really vague about. And obviously bottom feeder Kent doesn't uh, have anything on. So I put some link ins on that one. And by the way, then jump right in uh, uh, Jackson, if there's any comments that you wanna make on any of these things, uh, uh, otherwise I'll go on forever. Let's see what's going on over in the live chat. Um, oh, AJS says they're actually home to watch this live. Yay. I'm not sure whether watching me live or watching me after the fact is more or less entertaining. I don't know. You can all weigh in on that one. Um, but uh, so there's the Browns mammoths. Uh, there's a good chance that he'll bring that up because if he brings it up in multiple videos, he's probably going to trot it out this time. Um, he'll probably have pulled up his little PowerPoints. And uh, a lot of the slides are shown around. There's a website that I put up that's a Hovind a shill site that um, we'll, uh, I'll be cutting to in a moment, uh, or mentioning in a moment. Uh, but the main thing that Hovind likes to tout is the Hovind theory. And, oh, this sounds important. It's the Hovind theory. And he keeps on saying that he doesn't know whether or not um, uh, it's true or not. He's just proposing it, but he sure sounds like it's true. It's the ice canopy. It's this idea that there's this billiard ball of ice around the earth before the flood and the ice falls down and that's what freezes the mammoths and does all this stuff. It was a silly theory that is not Hovind's original. He didn't come up with this. Don Batten did in the 1960s. I remember when my high school physics teacher stopped class one day to talk about the ice canopy. Uh, uh, and that's how I found out about it. This was back in the 1960s. So uh, apparently he was kind of like a creationist friendly physics guy. And uh, amiable, wonderful teacher. I always loved. Hezekiah Tex Brown. Uh, I still remember his name after all these years. Little, little itty bitty guy with cover with shock dust. He was just wonderful. Um, an excellent teacher, but he, he probably had a little bit of a creationist streak. Anyway, uh, the ice canopy model has shown itself to be so fantastic that absolutely no creationist has bothered with it since. And it's uh, and Hovind is unique in trying to put this thing up. I mean, he, uh, we await his monograph. You might want to mention the fact that, you know, where is your technical paper, Kent? You've been, you've been trotting this thing out for over a decade. Why don't you do a technical paper where you're explaining the physical mass of this thing? You're working out the gravitational tidal issues between the moon that would be tugging on this big blob of ice. that's only about six inches thick, according to that. And, uh, and the ad hoc things he does with this stuff is really hilarious. One of the arguments that he argues is that maybe the, the thing is held up by magnetics and that the earth had a much stronger magnetic field back then. And that there's also air pressure, like holding up a, a, a balloon thing on the inside or a, a, a air pressure mode. And of course he doesn't offer any technical literature or citations on this. He never has done that in any of his posts. And one of the arguments that he uses is the space shuttle exhaust. This is one that popped up in the 2017 video where some space shuttle exhaust has been detected circulating very quickly up to the poles. Well, very quickly is like a day or two. And uh, he uh, implies based on old material, uh, the first ones he trotted out were like 2002 and three era stuff. And he's still using exactly that same stuff in 2017. So it's way out of date. Uh, that he implies that the magnetic field is the reason why the particles are moving up to the north uh, so quickly. Do you think the 100 plus mile an hour winds might be having a factor? Uh, the, the, if you measure the distance out, which I did on my globe, and calculate what 100 to 150 mile an hour winds up in the mesosphere do, that they fluctuate and they are very turbulent, they just discovered all of this stuff. No, the magnetic fields you know, are... are relatively trivial matter in here. There would be some effect in some respects, but but it's just irrelevant. And the fact that he's never done any further research on it. So I put up a couple papers uh, that are relevant to measuring temperature things, which they do with ice crystals. And the ice crystals are affected by the stuff uh, that you get. At, at, and the North and the South Poles function rather differently because of the different amount of water and the different uh, circulation patterns over the ocean. It's like complicated stuff. And the scientists do the work and Kent doesn't. So there's a, a, a perpetual uh, factor on that one. Uh, let's see. So we got the uh, the space shuttle ISO. I put some linkages up on that. Um, another one is the Mars floods. He's gotten enamored of the idea that the uh, a catastrophic water flooding that we can detect on Mars, and there's been papers on it, and I put up links to it, uh, somehow or other makes it real easy to explain the, the Grand Canyon. And even the picture he puts up is of this channel going from the, the uh, early lake down to this little crater that it filled up. And it's hundreds of kilometers. 
uh, involved. It's quite a long thing, and it's like 20 kilometers wide. It's a big trench that was cut by this thing a long time ago in a, in a planet far, far away. Uh, the problem is it doesn't look anything at all like the Grand Canyon. <laughs> it's not nested V-shaped valleys. It's not a meandering river. Uh, it, it's not what you find from an incised canyon, which occurs when you have a differential between outflow and inflow that's happening faster than the water can char carve the canyon. That produces an incised canyon. If you have just water breaking into a channel and running downstream in one gush, you get what we get here in the Columbia, but he mentions the, the Missoula floods, same thing, vertical wall canyons, scour down to bedrock, uh, all that kind of stuff, you find that. And so I put up some technical paper from more recently, there's a 2015 paper that goes into the flooding systems and a lot of illustrations and stuff. And, uh, oh, hi, Brian, says tension professor. I, I wish I were a mere professor, but no, I'm just a pundit uh, with a BA uh, in, uh, in history and, and a YouTube camera uh, so that I can deal with it. But anyway, um, the, um, uh, the material on the Mars floods, it doesn't help the Grand Canyon case, which still has, as um, Jackson has already been assembling the fact that you've got particular kinds of things that have to happen in a flood to produce canyons. And it ain't that. Uh, um, it, it's not merely water. In fact, uh, super fast uh, canyons are water formation, do very specific things, and it isn't what we see in the Grand Canyon. And he, he is very, very slow on this stuff. Repeatedly, he brings out, and you, when you watch him in your debate, if he does manage to trot out PowerPoints, uh, check to see how old the sources are, because Kent just gets stuck on the same old crap, and he just can't move off of it. Uh, so there's the Mars flooding. Um, the one of which he mentioned in one of his videos is the upended whale. Uh, that's another canard of creationism. It was debunked long before he was repeating it. He never mentions any of the repeat problems, doesn't get into any of that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing he doesn't do too is mention that he is a low man on the totem pole in creationism that he is not a fact claimant, he's not a serious, he is not taken seriously at an ICR or AIG, and in fact gets poked at a lot. And on the matter of the, um, the ice canopy and, and the um, uh, vapor canopy model, he vaguely alludes to the fact in the videos that there are some people who disagree with him on this. It's more than disagreement. It's Larry Vardaman calculating that it's physically impossible to do what <laughs> <laughs> a, a vapor canopy has. It's, it, their own apologetics are saying this. Another one that they put up, and I put a link to it, is the flash frozen mammoth, where the Institute for Creation Research said, no, sorry, that's impossible. Uh, stop saying this. It's bad for the religion to repeat this claim. And yet, Hovind never alludes to his own creationist side here. He's behind their curve, let alone the regular science curve. Um, so anyway, the upended whale thing is a matter of where they, the, the creationists are constantly exaggerating it. I think it's in Lompoc, California somewhere. And I put the link up to it. It's not actually vertical. It's over on a side. It was uh, laid in a perfectly normal deposit and there's been tectonic since. No coincidence. It's on a fault zone. <laughs> we know that land masses get twisted and contorted on that San Andreas fault. Uh, that in the in the 1906 earthquake places you know went blunk and blunk <laughs> and uh, and so the idea that this stuff gets contorted over millions of years into the positions that you see now and then new deposits come in and, and fill in um, now it's it's a known geological thing and it was wrong when he said it he relies on creationist stuff that's really old and that leads me to iguanodon oh the old R J just got happy when he brought up iguanodon. And he quoted a particular quote from Colbert, um, uh, the paleontologist uh, Colbert from 1958, and I instantly recognized it. It's the one that's in the quartet of creationist claims that's in Henry Morris's 1985 creationism book. And the reason why I know it intimately is because Richard Milton cribbed all four of those in his writing and, and quoted the, the, the scientist's work, which was a general science work, and not anything about the original material, nor did any follow-up. Well, Kent Hovind made the same thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Iguanodon, it's a big a herbivorous dinosaur, fascinating critter uh, that you, if you take a look at them, you'll go, oh yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, they, they, they pop up in, in um, dinosaur cartoons and all sorts of stuff. Great big thing, relatively bipedal, although their front limbs can knock down their late Jurassic 
uh, before the big hadrosaurs in the Cretaceous. They're starting to develop the battery of, of grinding teeth that later on become very, very common in the hadrosaurs, uh, all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, anyway, um, there was a famous deposit of those in Bernissart, Belgium, where in the old view, the one that was being talked about in a 1958 popular science book by a paleontologist half a century ago, um, that it was in, they were in a crevasse because they were stacked vertically. Well, this is like that whale example. And this was the view that pervaded for quite a while until those pesky taphonomists started looking at it more closely. And by the time David Norman, the world's authority on iguanodon, uh, did his dinosaur encyclopedia, uh, it had reached the stage where he said, nope, that was wrong. It wasn't a crevasse. There was no crevasse there. Uh, recent taphonomy work had shown that it was just a bend in a river and iguanodon bones being the largest herbivore of that particular region, pieces of them would, would catch on the bend in the river again and again and again in this weird little jumble that eventually got twisted all around and rendered vertical over a hundred million years or more and ended up with the formation that we have now. So this was known by 1985 at the time, Henry Morris was screwing it up in his 1985 book. And then along comes uh, Kent Hovind in 2005, repeating the quote from a 1958 book that he must have gotten from a creationist from way earlier, that he never bothered to do research for 2005. Uh, anyway, I put a link up to uh, Dinomania because I went into all of that. I think page 208 on, I go into the whole Iguana de Bernissart story, and, and there's a whole bunch of, of uh, side issues involved in that. But you get to find out about Richard Milton and the idiot. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, Brooke, um, I, um, uh, I'm focusing entirely on uh, the Kent Hovind thing with uh, with Jackson. So uh, I'm, uh, I've got to skip on putting any other links into anybody. This is, this is I'm afraid, our show uh, on this particular one, because um, uh, I want every possible moment available for Jackson to be able to get as much material under his belt. And then he got, has to decide, Jackson, no offense, Jackson, but you're not an actor type. And so you're not one that is as good at improvisation, which I am because I got some theater experience. And so he's got to do a crash course in calm, cool, collected improv in a way that's very, very different from the, the technical discussions and the videos and that, that he does. It's, it's a practice skill. And more time that he has to practice on that to be able to, to, to pull it off as effectively as possible, the better. Because Kent is a bullshitter gish galloper. And so you've got to be able to handle him. And the fact that he's coming in for a fixed debate is an advantage because he's constrained by the time frame. He can't hijack the conversation. Also, it's going to be a relatively short conversation, a uh, uh, Q&A level, apparently only 14 minutes, according to what? Jackson put forward. Uh, I had a much longer Q and A because I love Q and A, uh, but uh, you'll have to make the most of that one. Um, the um, uh, so we got the uh, Iguana in manner. Then so uh, that's one that if he makes the mistake of bringing that one up, you got him nailed because this one is defunct at the time it was put forward and has not got any more defunct or less defunct in the decades since. That is just a dead letter, uh, and you'll find that. There are a whole bunch of these fossil graveyard things that pop up in the creationist lore. First of all, they're very rare. If anybody who knows how big the planet is and how much fossil deposits there are, the vast majority of them are not fossil graveyards. These are unusual. And that's why paleontologists break out the champagne bottles and, and go, yay, fossil graveyard. And the reason why they're so giddy about these things is because you've got a bunch of animals of the same species typically, or a bunch of animals together that have all gotten mushed together and it allows you to get a clue about what was alive at the same time and what variations were occurring within that taxon. To have lots of coelophysids, a hundred, a thousand of them even in some cases if they're little itty bitty animals, um, it allows you to see the variations in bone size, the variation in, in skull, uh, jaw form, to see how much range you have. And it, with an individual fossil, you can't see that, but with a bunch of them all dying at the same time, yay! Can they die at the same time without a global flood? Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a wonderful, um, Tim White, uh, I think, uh, was the uh, lecturer. And he's a wonderful lecturer. And he was doing a, a discussion about the, the big picture of the human evolution. Uh, it ran on for like about an hour long lecture. And it was just magnificent. I, I, I put it in my bibliography because uh, it was so useful. And particularly because one of the things was, 
he was there at a time that their dig got um, uh, suddenly interrupted because there was a big flash flood on the local river and mud piles were coming down uh, from the river. Perfectly natural phenomenon. And there was this shot of this truck with its hood stuck up out on an angle from the, the, the mud. Obviously a whole vehicle was buried down. This thing was easily uh, um, 10 feet or more of gunk uh, in there. And you can imagine there must be animals that have been caught in this down there. Those are potentially fossils in the making. That's exactly how it works. Most of the time it won't do that because you just have to have the luck of the draw that it happens at just the right time where there's migrating animals crossing the river and uh-oh, and a bunch of them get caught. That happens once in a while, every so often, especially over millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. Well, duh, that's going to happen now and then. But it's very different from what you would find in a simultaneous hyper super duper flood event. So um, uh, Hovind's theory uh, wants to have uh, all of this happening at once. And it's not just Hovind. Young Earth creationists in general have to have too much happening all at the same time. It's like uh, it's like an X-Men movie on Benzedrine. It's just too much all occurring at the same time because you've got to have coal forests turning into coal seams. You've got to have um, uh, frozen mammoths and you've got to have volcanic eruptions and you've got to have um, uh, 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 animals being sloshed in and canyons being formed and canyons being not formed and new... Oh, it, 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 it. Trying to look at every single deposit frame that way and to see, does the data actually fit that? Well, what about intermittent volcanic ash? How can you have airborne ash in a flood environment on top of and below it? You've got too much things happening all at once. And that that sequence, that um, it's no coincidence that Kent Hogan is always vague about the details and that he never, as in not ever, as in never, zero, nada, writes out a paper in detail explaining what the hell he thinks happens with even one particular deposit, like what's under his own feet there in Alabama or what's going on up in my neck of the woods in here. He brings typically will bring up the Missoula floods and he'll bring up Mount St. Helens and he'll trot out old pictures of the canyons formed in Mount St. Helens. Well, I guarantee you, if you go back there today, you won't see canyons. They will have eroded away because that's what happens to little itty bitty things like that in the natural world. The climate and geology and that doesn't stop. You, they have to actually, the, most of the places have been reforested both by intentional reforestation, but also just natural reforestation. And the animals come back in and boop. And so you go back to Mount St. Helens today and except in the actual crater area that is kept pristine and also because gunk is periodically spewing out and kills off anything at the immediate crater area, the rest of the place doesn't look at all the way it did when I came in in July 1980 after the eruption. And it's like, woo, weird stuff. So it's no coincidence that that he will rely pathologically on really old stuff. And it'll show right up in front of you by the dates of things. And you'll want to call attention to that and point out that he never does follow up. He doesn't bring up newer material. He wasn't doing it in the 2017 thing. The, the, you can argue that a 20, 2005 video relying on some stuff from a few years earlier is sloppy if he hasn't bothered to look closely even then. But it's pathetic a dozen years later when he is not doing any follow-up whatsoever and the technical literature is directly accessible to anybody who would bother to look, which means he never did look. Didn't occur to him to do that. So let's find out if we've got something going on in here. Uh, <laughs> uh, anything in the live chat? It looks like, uh, oh, we got, um, oh, Brooke. Uh, yeah, she's going on in my paper. Yeah, we'll have to have a chat on on, on uh, what's been going on with Brooke uh, at a time. Uh, hit me up for a, a, a chat or do one your, on your own channel. Again, a delightful time on that uh, material. Anyway, uh, Jackson, uh, that, uh, oh, the bell in the pot, the bell in the pot, Nicole. That was, uh, yeah, we got the iguana in. Uh, two more things. Uh, Chinese calendar. That's another one that uh, a good old uh, Kent decided to trot out that supposedly the calendar of the Chinese culture correlates exactly that all these calendars are starting up at the time of the um, uh, flood and post flood as cultures develop afterwards. And um, he put up a, a, a link both in the 2005 and again in 2017, as I recall, 
that had a, a, a web link that you could go to and a reference to an article from February 2000 something or other uh, that was a creationist article by um, somebody or other. Very vague. Well, I text search. Remember, he's a copyist and he tends to be very, very um, superficial and found that that popped up on a Prohovin website. So it's probable they copied it from him rather than the other way around. The tiny problem is the link doesn't work. It's a defunct link. How long it's been defunct, who knows? But it certainly was defunct at the time that he was trying to do the show. And I tracked down the creationist article, which wasn't from 2000. It was from uh, 1999, got the date wrong. And it doesn't offer any sources whatsoever, none, for the dating of those calendrical systems and the, the provenance of them. So it's it's a flimsy article, and I put the links up to all the stuff on that. So he 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 trots stuff out that sound good, but the the common rule should be, and you might want to point this out in your rebuttal to him or discussion with him. Don't ever trust what he puts up on his powerpoints. Track them down because you'll probably find out that they aren't what you think they are, or they're really screwball sources, they're secondary sources and all of that. So the Chinese calendar, and then last but not least, the bell in the pot. Uh, part of the old tradition of um, uh, um, out of place objects, Charles Fort was going on about this back in the 1920s of weird things. People would find uh, an iron hammer in a coal seam and supposedly this was uh, completely incomprehensible. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of ways that those can happen. A lot of these things turn out to be uh, uh, in the coal slurry production process. Uh, the gunk comes out and somebody drops a tool or something that they had with them as a trinket and it gets mooked in with the thing and the thing solidifies and it gets pushed in with the coal and then somebody chip, chip, chips there in their living room, which is how this bell came about. And the little kid when he was 10 years old uh, found the bell inside of the coal. And it's very likely that it was a Hindu bell. It was some... Uh, the, the one creationist site that I put a link up to was actually uh, trying to criticize the argument that this was a, a thing that can happen. And so they thought how preposterous it was that some Hindu was wandering around and dropped this bell in, in the coal thing. Why would you imagine that somebody, that there weren't Hindus working in, the, uh, in America who had migrated to America? The people didn't have religions and all sorts of things and they keep things with them or something that somebody picked up. Maybe if they were in the British army and they were in India and they picked up a trinket that they'd found there and uh, brought it with them all the way to America when they decided to migrate and then their kid kept it and uh, was carrying it around as his little souvenir of dad who was killed by a train wreck. And there's, all, there's a whole mass of potential potential opportunities for things like that to have happened to where somebody, whoops, it drops down into the, the, the muck and that's how it happens. Uh, and an iron pot was exactly the same way. So I put up some material and all of this stuff dates back to the 1990s, early 2000 era. So it was already, the criticisms were already on the field when Kent was bringing this stuff up in 2005 and it's way behind the curve for him to be repeating this stuff in 2017 without any follow-up, no further research at all. It never dawns on him to look at stuff because he's a lazy, bottom-feeding, parasitical pseudo-scholar. That's Kent Hovind to a T. And he shows zero signs of this. He is so far behind the curve that he never even bothers to be noticed by the creationist higher up on the food chain except criticize him once in a while. Um, Oh, uh, Brian Stevens put up a thing on the Chinese calendar. Yes, the math NSUS. Um, uh, that uh, All this stuff. The internet is not Kent's friend because it's now so much accessible and you can triage to the look of the difference between some silly uh, commenter site and somebody who's a legitimate scholar in the field. And then ideally you want to ground things in technical literature that's in the, the, the historical uh, analytical stuff. There's uh, most unfortunately a lot of those journals that deal with history uh, aren't available online. They're in specialized collegiate environments. They still depend on subscriptions. They don't put their stuff online. Or if it's really old material, uh, it may not be accessible that way. Even some of the older technical literature, uh, you'll find that they only start putting the online stuff up in 1995. So if there was an article from 1980, you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, Brooke says that, that she should I should apologize right now to the bottom feeders. That is not nice to insult them like that. Yes, yes, that, that no self-respecting bottom feeder low and as pathetic as Kent Hovind. Uh, so let me put up my, we're just.
just past the hour on here. Uh, let me put a uh, week can rattle and thank to patrons and all of that. And so I got to do my look around the round of the mulberry bush as usual to get my screen share up and hope my mouse works fine. And there we go. And the infinite regress. Here is the screen share. The RJ's tip patrons. We got a new one just uh, um, this week. Uh, Stephen and Mary Gail and Keith and Dyer and Andrew and Eat and Yui and Mona and Hendrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Bo and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Sun Sky Stone. That's the new one. And uh, Suras, who's uh, helping record my uh, audio uh, book version of the Paralogs of Phileas Fogg. Please get the hard copy. Uh, you can find links at my website or get it at Amazon. Uh, Totus Real, Everett and Paul. Thank you all. And there's my website again, put it up, say hi, share it to everybody, download the PDFs, talk about it, use the work, follow the source methods thing, get on the game fan there. Uh, the Patreons who have helped out, I remind them that Patreon is slow as molasses on actually getting money out. Uh, and so if this is in effect just an honorary thing. The people who help, I'm very grateful and someday I will see some of that money. Uh, whereas the GoFundMe.com DC Go, that's the place to directly help. I know you're out there. There are thousands and thousands of people who uh, kind of like what I've been doing here. Uh, but uh, you, if more of them would help, uh, move collectively, uh, five, ten bucks, everything is is helpful. If you can be a, a regular patron, that's even better. Uh, that if you can spare like um, 50, 60 bucks a year, uh, that's five uh, bucks a month. Uh, on a steady basis that like the, the P PBS does exactly the same thing where um, they have sustaining patrons that way. I'm not asking you to hawk the car or, or, or uh, um, sell the grandmother. Uh, if you have some money to spare uh, of the kind of stuff that you might spend on a, a, a family outing to the movies and popcorn, good God, that can set back a ton of money these days. So if there's any squeaky money that you can do, or or, or you, instead of buying the overpriced latte, you go, yeah, I can throw, I can say thanks to RJ uh, with that. Uh, I'm, it's there, and so the GoFundMe is very, very helpful. Uh, I am still a Social Security retiree guy who's doing this as a, a underfunded hobby. And then there's the books. So uh, uh, evolution slam dunk on the science, and um, I'd love to see more sales of that. Uh, and uh, everybody who's read the book needs to rate review it. Uh, it's very slow going on uh, people putting those ratings up, and that's important. It's important to tell everybody about it. If you think that my work is important enough for Neil deGrasse Tyson or Richard Dawkins or uh, Jerry Coyne or anybody else to know about, let them know. Go on their website, tell them about it. Uh, say, poke, poke, prod, prod, because uh, I can't do that. I'm I'm the, the guy rattling his own can here. And so I'm dismissed out of uh, self-interest. Uh, but other people can say that for them. And if you've read the work and you feel that this is important stuff that, that is contributing something, I deliberately wrote Evolution Slam Dunk to cover a subject that had not been covered by anybody properly before, literally. So it's a contribution to the field, and I'm very, very proud of it. And Jackson has read it, and other people have read it. They realize that it's 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 an important work. I made I made it to fill a field, uh, and so the, there's no reason why we can't be slamming the reptile mammal transition at anti-evolutionists. It flummoxes them because they can't deal with the data. And if you read my book, you'll know every counter argument that it, the, there's only like 20 anti-evolutionists that have even tried to deal with the reptile mammal transition, and they're all pathetic. And, and really hilariously lame. Plus, there's a ton of science in it. And now the new book that um, uh, I had to postpone work on that day because I was just suddenly doing uh, Kent Hovind research. Uh, but uh, the rocks are still there that we're working on, which hopefully next year we will have complete and we'll be able to enter the field. That We're going to do the same game for Answers in Genesis, their Answers books. There's not been a proper demolition job on the arguments being put forward in the answers books on biology and astrophysics and uh, uh, paleontology and their flood claims and their rejection of evolution generally and human evolution in particular. It's, and some of them have science creds, uh, theoretically, Jeffrey Tompkins and Georgia Purdom and all that. And nobody has really taken them on properly. Um, the, the NCSE doesn't really do that anymore. Uh, there are lowly websites and things that do little spot things. But it needs to be pulled together as a unit and up to date and technically accurate that will function both for the layman and also for people at the college level.
to where you've got the ammo and that any creationist that tries to say well have you read the answers books yeah we've done that been there done that so uh, that's part of our our task to deal with is to is to up the ante to a source methods approach uh that um is the killer app here let's find out what's uh uh, Ken Hoven is the equivalent to uh, Plectostomus. Uh, is, is that a, f a bacterial form, or that uh, uh, does that ring a bell with you, Jackson? <laughs> oh, scientific notation for horses ass. You learn something for every day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I'll I'll I'll. Oh borrow yes, Plectostomus. Plectostomus is a catfish. When you said that, I was like, the what? Yes, Plectostomus is the is the 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 algae eater, the catfish that mm. people usually get for their fish tanks. The bot their uh, bottom. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it, it's uh -huh. it's even worse than that because you can have um, bottom feeders who are at least uh, careful about their bottom feeding, that they're circumspect about trying to pick the best of the arguments that are twaddle and not necessarily fact-checking them. But Ken Hovind feeds the worst of the arguments. He feeds on stuff that's been debunked even by creationists, and that's an issue that he is very reluctant to deal with. He always preens. That's why I call him the the, uh, the Donald Trump of creationism. He's somebody that that is a Dunning Kruger in a in a, a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, he uh, is uh, extremely superficial in his research. He is prone to sec selectively copying other people's arguments and giving the impression he's kind of rubbing shoulders with him and he's involved with this. And oh yes, yes, uh, praising other people who are just as bad as he is. Walt Brown at least tries to cite technical literature and mangles them if you start looking at the details, but Kent doesn't even get to that level. And you'll notice he doesn't write much. He will not put stuff down on paper typically because if he does, he's going to have to document it and he's going to, or you'll notice the absence of documentation. So if the more we force wooists to have to use source methods to where if you want to make an argument, fine, but you've got to make it better than what you've done. You've got to offer source documentation that everybody can check. You've got to put through what you really think happened with all the available data. And boy, that all the available data thing, relevant data thing can screw them. Because if you try to make a flood argument where you're really trying to account for the full data field, you're going to quickly discover it won't work. And that's you find this in certain salient areas. The, the, the attempt to try to work out some ice canopy, vapor canopy, weird way that the world could be very, very different. They bog down constantly at the details. They have troubles figuring out what the pre-flood um, layout was. Some of them go for Rodinia. Some of them go for Pangea. But, but they, they, they're always about ready to get it. And you find the same thing with astrophysics. Oh, to where I was, yeah, um, I was looking at Andrew Snell's paper. Yeah. It turns out the world was Rod it was made as Rodinia. Then during the flood, quickly became Pangea. And then... Spread to the modern configuration. Yeah, that's that's the that's the higher level creationist model. Although remember, Kant is a bottom feeder, so he's just barely catching up with Pangaea. And there are a lot of earlier creationists, earlier as in like 1990s, 2000 period, uh, that were just latching on to Pangaea. So in their model, Pangaea would be the pre-flood world, uh, but the, they, they've had to move on because that won't work and Rodinia won't work, and Columbia, and uh, the various other uh, uh, Precambrian supercontinents aren't going to really work either, because you've got the same problem. I'm, I'm going to be calling attention to this in my section that I've been doing on the um, uh, Grand Canyon and the, uh, um, the geo radiometric dating issue, because it pops up in what isn't there, that in this giant flood slurry, uh, you really would expect a lot more stuff being mushed together and theoretically, animals that can fly are going to be flying as long as they can to avoid drowning. Of course, there's rain and stuff coming down and, and they have to land on, on stuff. But the idea that you wouldn't find once in a while your cute little uh, uh, carboniferous super dragonfly and a plesiosaur and a, a, a condor and trilobites and stuff slobbed together given the fact that we can see they are existing in different time frames in the same physical ratio, relationship to one another, but not in the same deposit. How did they get sorted out that way? It won't work. RJ, birds are able to get to higher places 
What about oh, freaking yes. penguins and ostriches? What the heck happened to them? Oh yeah, I didn't I didn't put a link in on this, but one of the things I broke out laughing on is is kangaroos. He mentioned kangaroos in one of the videos, and I can't remember whether it was the 2017. And his argument is that the kangaroos were able to hippity hop ahead of predators and, and that they're really docile, calm little creatures that died out everywhere else because the predators got to them. Apparently, he does not know how quick a cheetah is. And so the idea that you're, you're, um, uh, the kangaroos should and marsupials in general should have somehow miraculously made it all the way down to the thing. They're supposedly caught at the times the sea level suddenly changed and then they couldn't get back. Well, why wouldn't some of the predators been chasing after them and, and placental mammals? Are, aren't any of them at least as frisky and a few of them managed to make it across? No, uh, that he never is going to be able to account for all the data that way. Plus, anybody that's ever bumped into any of these kangaroos, especially some of the killer fossil types, uh, belligerent is a word that is very easily used to describe kangaroos. They have a very testy manners and they can be extremely violent with one another and with things attempting to eat them. The reason why they manage to uh, thrive in such unusual ways is that they've had tons of time since Australia separated. <laughs> they make great viral videos. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, is that there was a long time for them to be separated and then they could go their merry way evolutionarily and they had no placental predators to go after them. We can see the process of extinction in South America where there was a faunal interchange. Again, how does the flood geologist think about this? Every single critter that's known living or fossil would have to have a history that can be accounted for rigorously only 4,400 years ago in the flood context. By all means, do it, Kent. Take, take your stuff and do it, but do it. Don't pretend that you've done it. Don't call something a theory that's not even a hypothesis. It's even a bad guess. Uh, it's way far down the food chain. You, uh, he hasn't even graduated to hypothesis stage. So calling it the Kent Hovind theory is like calling it the unicorn theory or the um, uh, did Sherlock Holmes masturbate theory. Uh, any of those are, are, are ones exist. that are... Yes, yes. <laughs> well, you know, probably not within the next 50 years, but, you know, currently. <laughs> I put a link up to my debate with Kent uh, and in the link to that, I also alluded backwards to uh, the thing that Brooke brought up, which is about the fact that Kent at one point drew heavily upon Harun Yaya, the wacky Turkish creationist who has uh, been uh, put in the slammer because of his um, sex abuse uh, scandal stuff that's been popping up in the highly puritanical Erdogan regime uh, that is scary for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, finally uh, dumped on him. And so um, there's I mixed bags about the fact that uh, that. Uh, it's a corrupt regime and weird that has um, called him to account. Uh, and we'll find out what happens there. So I have almost a microsecond of sympathy for a Yaya until I start looking at the claptrap that he puts up on his websites and which can't copy. Uh, so I alluded to that in my video with him. And um, uh, I want uh, Jackson to perform as elegantly and effectively as anyone can between me and Aaron Ra and all the other examples out there so that he can just squash him like a bug <laughs> well here's hoping yeah and in and, and practice comes into it uh so that you can be easy and cool and, and comfortable um you'll be aware as much as possible of the kinds of stuff that kent's done before and you're playing off of the fact that he's very repetitive he's not an original thinker he's not he he might if some miracle occurs uh, bring up a really new bit of stupid that you would not be necessarily aware of. But then you can play off the fact and says, well, I've researched a bunch of stuff that Kent has done. And in every case, he relies upon slipshod, misreading of sources, dated sources, doesn't do follow up. Uh, what do you want to bet? He's done the same thing again here, but we'll look into it and we'll put the references in the um, uh, comments. That's how you can handle new material. That's one of the first things I looked at with regard to his actual material was the um, was the paleomagnetic reversals, which for anyone who doesn't know, his own, literally his only argument, because he copies directly from Walt Brown, and he says as much in his lecture, is a single quotation 
from a 1979 paper, which is a quote line. The paper, yeah. the paper itself doesn't even argue against paleomagnetic reversals. And he yeah, uses it as an argument against paleomagnetic To use something like that that's that old, uh, as I point out, it's in the era of VCRs. They were new. Fax machines were a hot ticket item. Wow. Uh, you know, you were just starting to work up to 31-inch television sets. You know, this is just amazing. Uh, th that This is just pathetic to draw upon a little quote blip. But in Kent's mind, where there's literally no difference between primary and secondary sources, he literally can't tell the difference. Um, and, and the Bible is an example of a gigantic uh, secondary source. Uh, that will be another matter is that you'll want to avoid like the plague ever bringing up the Bible unless he brings it up first. If he does, that opens the doorway. But stick to the science material at every point because he's trying to argue that the science supports this. Well, then golly gosh. Oh, uh, I really was just flabbergasted that when he was talking about the ice canopy after trotting out this old source. Uh, from 2003 about the uh, 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 ice crystal stuff. He then went on to his primary argument, which was Josephus. Josephus from the first, second century AD, Josephus happened to say that he thought that there was like ice put up in the firmament. Well, if you think about where you think snow comes from and all that, it's got to be up there somewhere. There must be like a little trough or something, you know, that that was fine if you're a second century Roman citizen. But it wasn't the uh, 21st. Didn't Trey, the explainer, talk about in his video on the Leviathan that there was like a shed for the snow and the rain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This was common uh, thought among scientific illiterates uh, in Roman times. And here he's trotting out Josephus like it's relevant. It's not even biblical text. I mean, if he wants to treat the Bible as gospel, find it dandy. But Josephus ain't gospel. <laughs> Josephus is just Josephus. He's a definite human being. He has no divine inspiration. Uh, so uh, why bring him up? Why not talk about the science? Why not do that that technical analysis about the, the tidal dynamics of the moon tugging on this alleged six-inch block of ice? And does it rotate? The Earth would be rotating. Is it rotating? Is it a fixed thing? So we're rotating underneath it. Is that a tidally possible thing because of the gravitational tug of the Earth on it? Uh, oh, I'd love to see him do the math. I think it would be hilarious to put him in front of a blackboard and and have somebody who are physicists uh, to to watch while he expounds on the technical dynamics of gravitational and tidal forces on a block of ice uh, above the Earth that is tens of thousands of miles along, and you know, I mean, the the, the volume of it is enormous, and just have them watch to wait to see if he can ever put a formula up. Whereas somebody like um, Stephen uh, or uh, Richard Feynman would be an example of somebody who could put the formulas up and they could start going on about the details and explain all the little stuff because it's their field. Uh, no. Can't well, I'm sure he doesn't even the amount of pressure required to keep a solid in the upper atmosphere yeah. or but suspended in know, the upper atmosphere. He does know about water. He likes to discuss water, water a lot. Water. He enunciates very carefully and water is very this is my glass of water. water. Yes, indeed. Uh, so it's going to be a, uh, um, a fun one to tackle. Um, it's uh, an opportunity. I want to change the, the landscape by putting forward source methods because uh, a lot of people have shied away from doing debates with creationists because they're coming at it from the wrong direction down. And uh, yes, Dyron Strink during their debate definitely wasn't water. Yes, well, if I had more budget, uh, I might have something other than water or uh, iced tea composed largely of water uh, than I do, uh, because a, a good sherry every once in a while is nice. And, and in the summertime, a rum uh, a, a daiquiri is perfectly delightful, but uh, that's a little more expensive. Anyway, um, the, the tendency had been to try to push people off of doing debates because it's just giving them a, a platform uh, and all of that. And if you're high up on the food chain scientifically, it is kind of giving them imprimatur. Uh, but we have an advantage. We're nobodies. <laughs> We're just common schlubs. And so we have just as much of a right to debate uh, the uh, creationist as anybody does. We don't have any reputation to lose. We're not standing up as the exemplar of the scientific institution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're just uh, interested lay people who don't like stupid when we see it and want to stand up and say it's not stupid. And we have our own areas of interest. And the source methods is precisely a 
thing that everybody can do. Uh, you do not need a degree to do it. Uh, it. You may know more if you have more technical expertise and have that, and you are uh, uh, going to college to get your degree. I have a BA in history. Uh, it's not even a science -y degree, but I can read. And source methods is a universal toolkit. It's you read the documents, you read the primary sources, you look and see what people do in terms of argument. You can spot that Kent Hovind is using a 2003 source that's from a general thing. Did he come up with it himself? Did he copy it from somebody else? Those are all scholarly methods issues. Those are source methods. And in every case with Kent that I have ever investigated, behind his flash is nothing. It's bad material that he's copied. It's uh, secondary stuff. Oh, he trots out all this terrible old material uh, from uh, old uh, uh, Cremo um, uh, on the, uh, the, I think the up ended whale came from Cremo and, and uh, who is a, a weird, Cremo and Tom are kind of Hare Krishna, super duper old earth creationists. They have human beings being millions of years old. And uh, so they want to find evidence that the people were, oh yes, there was one, yeah, the, the, the footprint thing. I have a link up to it. Um, that uh, he trots out this thing that he got from Cremo. It was about this supposed sandal print in a coal black. And it's it's cut off, so there's just a portion of it. And supposedly there is stitching and all the rest. Well, nobody can spot it. These are, are little blobs of accretions that occur naturally in geology. And what somebody has done is find one that's partial, that when you look at just one end of it, it looks kind of like a sole of a, a sneaker, but not that much. And it's a purely natural phenomenon. And so I put a thing, Glenn Kubin had done a, a piece on this. And again, it's years old. So either Hovind has not researched any of this stuff. You might want to try the trick along the way of saying, uh, uh, Kent should tell us now, does he ever bother to do follow-up research on any of the subjects he's just brought up? It doesn't look like he does. Take out your Bible and swear on it, Kent. Uh, tell us yes or no. Uh, that's an approach that I've um, uh, used occasionally with people, and, and uh, it, it puts them on the defensive. Do they really want to bear false witness on that one, or will they not want to tell the truth? Yeah, Mike Riddle. And he just went kind of aghast uh, with it. But uh, he, he's the one that believes in the Bible and that bearing false witness is a bad thing. So he should be able to stand up and say on that. He was at least honest enough to admit that he hadn't read a damn thing. He, he's an honest bottom feeder. Uh, an honest, se honest secondary parasite, Didn't but Kent Hovind's a dishonest one. He was going to like write a paper about his experience with us or something. I haven't seen anything from him. Don't hold anywhere. your breath on that one. <laughs> I think we we gave him a pretty good thrashing in that discussion. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, we're going to be giving him a pretty good thrashing in the new book because yeah. a riddle pops up a lot and it is just uh, well, I, I allude to the videos and stuff that we did with him because he I mean he is I think I was working on the white chapter like during or right after our discussion with riddle and so yeah so we roasted yeah, him was, pretty good it's a handy thing when you've got stuff that's fresh in your mind on it and uh, because creationists are often so bloody repetitive uh, there's an awful lot of stuff where I go well I was just researching that so I, I, I know the material too. I can dump on it directly and uh, we'll see what happens on that one. So you've got over a week uh, to be able to continue to hone your argument and, and build it up to where you're confident and comfortable on this. And uh, uh, I, I want more and more people to feel confident on this, that uh, you don't need to know everything about everything, but by having a network of people, you can find out about almost everything some way or other. And what I'm trying to do in, in what I'm trying to do is to gradually build up a network. If you're on Twitter, follow me, follow Jackson. Um, if you have particular scientists you're interested in and you discover that they're on Twitter or they have a Facebook page, um, make put the friend thing up and, and, and follow them. Um, I make use of that a lot. Every scientist I uncover that's in my technical bibliography uh, who's on Twitter, I follow them because they're my eyes and ears. They're looking in their fields. They're shop talking on, oh, this new material that's just come up and it's so important that I might not ever have discovered had it not been for the fact that they have called it to the attention of their followers. And so you can get caught up on the bigger picture by having a series of spider tendrils. That'll keep us with the Halloween theme uh, for the day. Uh, that is a fabulously powerful tool 
uh, that we can make use of. It's it's an easy thing to do. I like Twitter, frankly, more than Facebook, because Facebook is a series of little boxes that you can easily lose track from, whereas Twitter is a linear feed dumping on you in the order that it appears. And you can triage through that. I, I sometimes get stuck in um, uh, conversations. And the typical attitude of some of the people on Twitter is, oh, untag me from this. I'm tired of seeing these tweets. Untag me, please. I don't do that. I may be bored silly looking at some of the stuff popping in as I triage. But once in a while, you're going to find something where you go, uh oh, I've got expertise on that one. <clears throat> and I can jump in and then expand the thing and find out what the context is and then offer uh, material. Another thing that I've been seeing way too little of is enfilades, uh, where uh, two people or more who are ex expert in a particular area can suddenly take what was a spew of dumb and you start commenting between the two of you on the dumb. And now you're making it a methods discussion. And whether or not the dumb people come in, uh, you always pop in on my feed in conversations of 50 people. Yeah, oh yeah, you'll see a whole slew of where they'll say plus 48 others. Uh, that happens an awful lot on some of these things. Uh, and it's a, a learned skill set. Um, uh, we have the advantage now that we've moved up to 20, 280 characters. And we've got the fact that if you tag in lots of people, those aren't counted in the character count. Or if you put in links, those aren't necessarily counted as a character count. So you can actually squeeze a lot in. I try to avoid, I haven't figured out the, the trick of doing the picture gifts and all that stuff, but I don't like picture gifts. They're, they're not data and they're not primary source. They're just uh, wave your finger at somebody and uh, it can be amusing, but it's not informative. And uh, the more people that kind of say, no, you've just made this claim, what's your sources for it? Ask a source methods question. Oh, what an interesting claim you made. Uh, can you prove it? Says who? Says who is one of the easiest phrases, two, two words, says who? And did you check it? That's the other half of it. How did you know it's true? And a lot of the bottom feeders will scamper off immediately. You will not get a response from them. Well, that now becomes a data point. So the next time you bump into them, you say, oh, and, and what, what, where, where was the source for that? You never came forward on that. Why don't you do the source? Oh, I've been trying to bring this up to you for months. You keep on making this claim, but you never offer sources for it. Why not? Now you can make an issue of the empirical fact that they cannot do their source base, uh, either because they don't have one or because they're afraid to put it forward because they know it's going to be shredded uh, with um, people who know more about the subject than that. So that's the technique of doing it. Uh, it's uh, You can see me do it in uh, the debates and discussions that I do. You can see me do it uh, in uh, the tweets and things that I do. You, it's applied method. And pick my brain. Uh, everybody can ask me questions. Uh, you can uh, go to the website, which I try to check frequently to see if there's things, but people have not done much there. But Twitter is way better. If you ask a tweet of me and I miss it, it's because it's in a long string of stuff that was way or, uh, late. I'm typically working uh, through from the afternoon on into uh, the wee hours of the morning. So that would be like from uh, noonish Pacific time out until um, typically one or two in the morning um, the next day. And so that means you can adjust for whatever time zone you're in. That's a window that I'm going to be up. And uh, you tweet me directly on that. I will want to respond to that and say, oh, that's an interesting question. You can direct message me. That'll work as well. That, that'll definitely get my attention because the little windows do that. And I will respond to all. Uh, pick my brain. Uh, as Jackson knows, I've been at this a while. It's not that I'm smarter than anybody. Uh, it's just that I've been at it a long while. So I have a big data field that I can draw off of. And so the things that you may think you're just hitting for the first time, you don't realize there's a background to all of that. There's there's a history of why that argument was being made. There's a history of where they're getting their sources from. And we are showing that with Kent Hovind. Kent Hovind is a textbook example of what uh, the average bottom feeder that you encounter on Twitter is, except he's got a video YouTube tube channel. Same me methodology. Um, uh, we see what's going on over here. Uh, oh, um, 
yeah, you got to watch out. Uh, AJS talks about how some people will want to get you into a thing where they want to put a cell phone or they want to talk in some other venue. Uh, there are some wackaloons that were like that, that um, oh, um, C. Brown was one that he always wanted to get on the show. And I finally let him on the show and he just wanted to diatribe bullshit. You couldn't ask him a damn question. You didn't want to have a conversation and certainly didn't want to discuss source methods. There are others that I have not let on the program because they don't want to discuss what I want to discuss, which is their source methods. They just want to spew their, Brian, as an obvious example of that, they have their, their presuppositional um, arguments that they want to make, and you can't get them past that. You're not going to have a discussion with them. And you, you find those, uh, uh, oh, uh, somebody who's at least amiable, but falls into the same ballpark is Edgar, Mr. Intelligent Design, who if you ever bumped into him, you really are reluctant to ever on, bump into him again. He was on the non sequitur show talking with the is it Red's rhetoric just the other day, which I think is hilarious. I don't know <laughs> why they would give him the time of day. He's the oh, same man. shtick. He never changes. It's, he's got one. It's one not thing. even he's, shtick though. He he doesn't even have shtick. He has like inane ramblings. Yeah, I dropped he's the got egg through the tissue paper. He that's it. Yeah, that's it. The egg on the tissue paper uh, and the uh, that's basically his argument. He he has a, a grandeur about his grand intelligent design theory. Uh, actually, the one that was inadvertently extremely useful was when he had a discussion with Kent Hovind. And, and of course, Kent finally, even his eyes glazed over and he kind of backed out after a relatively short time. I think it was only like 20 minutes or so. Uh, but um, uh, the thing was that Edgar revealed that he is functionally a young earth creationist. That he was talking as to, uh, to Kent as a fellow traveler, young earth creationism. And so that biblical creationism thing that he keeps totally under wraps in almost all of his surface apologetics uh, came out instantly with uh, Hovind. And so that performed a useful uh, lesson. Uh, it was hilarious too, to watch, to find two people who together are not a halfwit uh, to just kind of bounce back each other uh, on things. And Kent, of course, has his evangelical obsessions and Edgar, it's is Edgar. <laughs> so he's in his own little world. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, uh, the idiot says Edgar and Pete Shea should team up and uh, and do uh, YouTube hangouts. That would be frightening, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so you you one thing you kind of want to do is uh, we'll probably be calling the short uh, show up short because pretty soon the kids are going to be knocking around for the um, uh, Halloween stuff and it's getting later and later here. But I'll just say that uh, you want to have a sense of where people fall on the spectrum of argument and then you target your discussion to them if they are a technical fact claimant and there aren't many 50 or so in anti-evolutionism that would be a different approach than you would deal with intelligent designers are different from young earth creationists because yec has a big pile of baggage to it way bigger than what you find with intelligent designers that are more tunnel vision michael behe and douglas axe and that crowd then you get down to the secondary apologist the 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 invigorated uh, apologist who has read a little and fact checked none of it. And they will have a source base that they draw off of, but they're trying to discuss it at source level, kind of, sort of. Uh, but then you get farther below that to your bottom feeder types who are using sources, but willy nilly and usually older. And that's where Kent is. And then way down below him are uh, the seat of the pantsers, the smorgasborders who have weird little ideas that they come up with and they don't really understand much of anything and they don't really have sources and they make weird claims and they have strange mixtures of things. You can find them mushing Hindu stuff in with Christian and they're, they're, it's it's like a weird bullia base down there. And, and they're below even the Kent Hovian level. Uh, Hovian is operating at a highly tight doctrinal level. Uh, uh, Avesta says, red is ruthless and can't stand fools. Yeah, there are a lot of fools out there. I don't know that there are any more than there used to be but we see them a lot and the, every fool can put up their YouTube now. And if you don't have methods approach to vet, uh, the fact that somebody is um, uh, putting up sources for their arguments or sound, uh, anti-vaxxers sound very sourcey if you look at their stuff superficially. Uh, and a lot of flat earthers can sound um, sourcey if you uh, look at them superficially. But the moment you try to fact check their material, you're going to find that they're leaving data out 
and they're not really thinking through what they think happened and they have no standards for changing their mind and you all of those four core uh, methods problems come through um anyway uh thanks for everybody for watching um uh, can rattle for tip uh, if you can help out at gofundme if you haven't gotten a uh, slam dunk yet get it please um if and tell spread the word on it if you like fiction um make it a double feature and get paralogs of Phileas fog I'm still working on recording the uh, audio book version, and then we'll try to do that. And after I get that under my belt, I'm going to do an audio ver book version of Slam Dunk. No one's really tried to do a more technically oriented work. It'll require a lot of massaging because you can't do footnotes or citations in an audio book. That'll bore the tears out of everybody. Uh, you got to organize it very, very differently. But I know the writer really close. And I can persuade the writer to rewrite the text on demand to make it work so that when the writer narrates it, the writer will be matching up with what the writer originally wrote. Hey, I can do that. So that will be the thing. So thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Brian, and a lot of you have, who have helped out already uh, on, uh, on the GoFundMe. You are most appreciated. It's squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. Uh, I could use a lot more because I'd love to be able to put fuel in the tank so that, that the furnace came on again today and I got to check to see where the, the little meter is, how far below three eighths of a tank it is because it, it, it gets cold here eventually. So anyway, um, uh, thank you all. And uh, we are now concluding this broadcast and we will be seeing you all uh, next week, hopefully. And I will not have been struck by lightning or the wrath of God or an asteroid impact, but I'll still probably be pissed off about Dinesh D'Souza. Okay, bye.